Deep to the cortex is a gray matter area known as the basal nuclei, or sometimes as the basal ganglia. This contains a whole bunch of different neurons. Some of them are listed on the slide, but quite honestly, there's a lot of active debate about what's actually part of the basal ganglia and what's not, and so I'm only going to cover this region of the brain superficially. So generally speaking, the basal ganglia play a role in both sensory functions and motor functions. And we'll think about the motor functions first. We could very broadly describe the role that the basal ganglia play in movement by saying that they gate or prevent unwanted movements. They're also involved in some rhythmic or patterned limb movements, which is, for example, why the basal ganglia are sometimes associated with the disorder Tourette syndrome. If you're familiar with the disorder, then you might know it's often characterized by unwanted movements and occasionally by verbal tics. In the last unit, we introduced the idea of muscle tone. So a lot of that baseline muscle tone is actually coordinated through the basal ganglia, as are some of the involuntary skeletal muscle contractions that are present throughout the body. And that's why uh, that deep brain simulation video was actually affecting this region of the brain, most likely. The basal ganglia can also play a role in sensation and possibly in some unconscious sensory processing, particularly processing unconscious visual stimuli. There's still a lot of debate about this, but in the meantime, if anybody wants to ruin your childhood, you can look up all the unconscious visual information, the subliminal information that was presented to you in some of your favorite Disney movies growing up. The basal ganglia can also play a role in mood and in emotion, and that's mostly because the amygdala is part of the basal ganglia. Now, I should mention that the amygdala is my favorite brain structure because it gets a lot of attention in the neuroscience world, and that's because of its role in emotion and emotional control over behavior. So in psychology labs, when people are doing fear conditioning of mice, they're uh, subjecting the mice to shocks or making them swim in water or giving them different kinds of fearful auditory stimuli. That's often relayed through the amygdala. One of my favorite studies of the amygdala compared the size of the amygdala in Buddhist monks to serial killers and found that Buddhist monks, which have a reputation for being very benevolent, have larger amygdalas than the serial killers who, as you guessed it, not as benevolent, actually have smaller amygdalas. And actually, there's a famous court case involving a sociopathic individual who was found to have a damaged amygdala when his body was autopsied following his execution. This makes the amygdala another point of intersection between neuroscience and the law. Now, thinking about the control of mood, it turns out that the amygdala is one of the first structures that can become damaged by chronic alcohol use. And so some people have hypothesized that damage to this region is one of the things that can often drive the long-term behavioral changes in people that struggle with alcoholism. And lastly, people have also found a role for the amygdala in sexual behaviors. So there was uh, one and actually a few studies now uh, trying to compare activation patterns in the amygdala among cis straight men, cis gay men, and cis straight women. Unfortunately, this type of work ends up being kind of similar to the studies on the frontal lobe. There's a tremendous amount of bias and it's really hard to imagine anything good coming from this type of research as it stands right now. If we continue moving deep, then the next brain region that we encounter is known as the diencephalon. This contains three structures of interest for us, the epithalamus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. Now the diencephalon as a whole is located just below the corpus callosum, which is the major white matter tract that connects the left and right hemispheres of the brain to each other. The epithalamus contains the pineal gland. I'll be talking about the pineal gland again later in the course when we get to the endocrine system, and that's because it secretes the hormone melatonin, which is important for regulating circadian rhythms inside the body, our sleep-wake cycle. This region also plays a role in our emotional responses to odor. So for example, some people vomit at the smell of vomit, or some people might feel happy or sad when they smell apple pie because it reminds them of their grandmother. That's what I mean by emotional responses to odor. The thalamus will become more important in our next unit, which is sensory systems. And that's because all sensory information that we're gonna talk about at least passes through the thalamus. 
but as we'll see, more than 90% of that sensory information that we collect from the external environment actually gets filtered. It never makes it up to the primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. And a lot of that filtering happens in the thalamus. And that's why people have often described this particular brain region as being kind of like a switchboard, because it's important for filtering signals that are ascending through it on their way up to the brain. The hypothalamus we're going to talk about in our last unit, again, the endocrine system, and that's because the hypothalamus is a really important controller for the endocrine system. It produces a lot of chemical messengers that regulate all sorts of chemical processes inside the body. The deepest and most inferior part of the brain is the brain stem. This region controls really critical, really basic autonomic functions inside the body. There's been many situations where people have damaged different parts of their cerebral cortex and they've survived. I've shown you some videos of some of those situations already. But it's almost impossible to survive when you have damage to your brainstem. And that's because it impacts really basic functions that are necessary for survival. So for example, the midbrain region will become important in our last unit because some of the cranial nerves originate from this region of the brainstem. And it also contains two structures known as the colliculi, which coordinate some visual and some auditory reflexes. The pons and the medulla we really won't talk about until the next half of the course. And that's because the pons is really important for respiration. The medulla is also important for the regulation of the respiratory system, but that region also contains the cardiovascular control systems as well. So again, really basic functions, right? Breathing, heart function. Finally, the last brain region is the cerebellum, which is important for coordinating movements. Remember that the initiation and planning of the movements is usually due to the primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe. So to give you an idea of what I mean by coordinating, I'm going to show you a movie of a person who has damage to the cerebellum. In addition to rest tremor and postural tremor, is intention action tremor seen with cerebellar disease. In this patient who has had a traumatic hemorrhage involving one side of his cerebellar white matter pathways, he has a normal function on the right side, but the left side shows significant dyssynergia and intention tremor. This type of tremor contrasts, however, with the postural tremor in that both the trajectory and the endpoint are abnormal, and most of this patient's dysfunction is in fact right at the endpoint when he tries to touch his nose or to bring his finger totally out. The trajectory is not normal, but the trajectory is not the area of maximal dysfunction. This type of tremor can also be seen in multiple sclerosis and other primary cerebellar disorders. So you can see that his right arm was fine, but his movements are abnormal in his left arm. One of the interesting things about the cerebellum is that it controls the body structures on the same side. So in his case, he's most likely had damage to the left side of his cerebellum. And what we're seeing in the video is something called an intention tremor, which is when you have trouble coordinating a precise movement. In other words, you have trouble matching your intended movement to your action. As he brings his finger closer and closer and closer to his nose, his ability to correct the trajectory and keep it on target diminishes. That's one of the major functions of the cerebellum. Again, it's not really important for initiating the movements, but it's important for coordinating them.